In case you miss it, here's a sports animal rewind. Let's bring in from Nashville someone that can certainly give us the inside scoop on whether Chris Johnson actually outran a cheetah. That would be Brad Hopkins. Brad, Vince, and Brendan in Knoxville. How you doing, Brad? I'm doing great. I guess you're going to have to wait till November like the rest of us to find out if you actually beat uh, that cheetah. Come on. You know what happened. You know the results I of that, Brad. I heard, I heard he got mauled. <laughs> Seriously, it, he didn't do this, did he? I, well, first off, I, I don't think that that uh, Mike Munchak would allow if he actually were here that his star running back is going to be, you know, racing an event basically where he's racing a, uh, a man-eating animal. <laughs> I don't think he'd go for that. I'm sure that it's probably in some byline in his contract that would forbid him from doing something that could possibly take him away from being able to compete this year. So I would doubt it. Did you, did you have any of those stipulations in your contract? Like, you know, like, like Russell oh. Bear or anything? Oh, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> interesting story about that. Um, you remember the incident involving one of our defensive uh, defensive backs? I'm not going to say by name. If you don't know, you can Google it. But the situation was that he missed a playoff game uh, because of a motorcycle incident. Well, that motorcycle actually belonged to me. <laughs> I, <laughs> I sold it to him. And it kind of started a lot of that. And also the whole situation with Percy Snow. You remember Percy Snow back in the day, Kansas City Chiefs running back or uh, linebacker? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was one of those ones that was involved in the motorcycle accident too. And that conversation started, and that's kind of where it started. Because there was a time back in the day when, you know, you did what you did. But then again, football wasn't near as year-round as it, as it is now. So, and the contracts weren't near as big either. So. Yeah, now those two things, that kind of language definitely is in, in players' contracts. We're visiting with Brad Hopkins, NFL All-Pro, or one of the great Tennessee Titans and Houston Oilers, does uh, sports talk in Nashville, joining us here on the new Sentinel Sports page. Uh, heard Tony Richardson talk about you, and uh, and certainly has complimented you before. Uh, you struck up a friendship with Tony Richardson. How did this come to be? How did you first start talking with him, and, and what do you think about Tony Richardson? You know, I've always been intrigued by the high school star, you know, guys. Mm-hmm. And, uh, my son, both my, actually all three of my kids started going to school where Tiny went to school and started really making a name for himself. So I've seen him around campus and I noticed how he had this rock star effect on this, on the student body, you know. And he was always such a grounded, good kid. And I always noticed that about him. So, one time I walked up to, you know, uh, I think it was his uncle, one of his family members that was there at the high school game with him. And I told him, I said, if, if Tiny ever needs anything, if he ever has any questions about, you know, the future, you know, things he might be embarking on, and he has, you know, he wants to talk to me about that, here's my number. Well, his, his relative took it a step further and, and made sure that I went over and, and talked with him. Like, so in other words, he brought Tiny over. So we struck up a conversation. Uh, he was very excited to, to have met me because having grown up there in Nashville, you know, he'd known we, you know, obviously the, the Titans being in town, he was familiar with who I was. And, uh, from there I could just see this hunger, guys, this, this actual yearning to, to want to be better. And it reminded me of, of me wanting to do the same thing, impressing a couple of guys by the name of Bruce Matthews and Mike Munchak. Those are the guys that I grew up underneath and, and I know that I had a, a definite competitive advantage being under the under the uh, the tutelage and the mentoring of those two guys, so I wanted to extend the same kind of uh, opportunity for for Tiny, you know, that I had coming in. Uh, maybe it'd be easier for him to understand process, slow the thing down, and really be able to make the best of of a of a, of a wonderful opportunity that seems to be developing. So we'll just see what he does with it. Yeah, I, I saw a quote, um, uh, kind of based on on your on a story on your your relationship, where. He talked about, you know, learning the position and, and, and understanding all the intricacies. And he said, if you look at the, you know, the, the all-time greats, and he, and he talked about Jonathan Ogden and Anthony Munoz. Like you would expect a guy his age to start, you know, naming great tackles who are playing now. But mm-hmm. uh, does he have kind of that that uh, the, the appreciation of the history of the position and, and the evolution of the tackle spot from, you know, Munoz on to guys like you and and moving forward now to the, the current players. You know what? I, I think that you know that's that's a great observation on your part because you know you I think being a historian of the game like a Peyton Manning kind of really makes you give you an appreciation for you know not only the history of the game but how hard and difficult it is. What a unique situation that it is, and I think that the tackles in group that he's rever- uh, that he's referencing. I mean, think about it, guys. That was a hell of an era for offensive linemen. 
when you're talking about Walter Jones, uh, you're talking about uh, Willie Rofe, uh, Lincoln Kennedy, uh, you know, just the, the, a host of other tackles that really were, were, were great for decades, you know. And I think him talking about those guys, it's probably what he would want to emulate himself, an era of great protection, which yielded great quarterbacks as well, too. So, you know, we'll see where he's where he lines up, where he fits in that. Because I think that we're coming into that same thing when you're talking about the Luke Gilkles, uh, the Jake Matthews, the uh, Antonio Richardsons. Here comes another group of great tackles, I think, and we're going to see that come into the league really quick. We're visiting with Brad Hopkins, former Tennessee Titan and Houston Orders great NFL All-Pro here on the New Sentinel Sports page. Uh, how good of a film watcher is Antonio Richardson? You know, I would say this. When it's, when it's detailed about him, oh, he's dialed in now. Because he wants to know everything he can to get better. And he, his attention may wane when it's, you know, about something else or maybe it's away from the ball, which, you know, that develops with maturity. You know, when you want to really use your experiences, because that's, put it this way, guys, you, you know that your, your body only lasts for so long, mm-hmm. all right? And you're only, be, you're only going to be able to use your athleticism for so long. So when you, what do you have to rely on next? Your experiences. You know, you, you're learning of the game. You know, learning from your mistakes. And, and that's what Tiny wants to do every time he's watching film. When he watches film and he sees something he didn't do well, he wants to go out there and work on that immediately because he wants to get that bad habit, that, that wrong technique out of his system so that way he can continue to develop. So that's the way he watches film. It's interesting you bring up the learning the game feeds into this question. I'm sure, sure you saw the stuff about Jadavian Clowney and t- t- saying that he's really good at holding and things like that. <laughs> and, and, and Tiny took it as a compliment. Um, for for the the layman out there, can you explain the art of holding without a whistle? You, you know what? You, you you guys are laughing. You think it's funny? Uh, please tell me how you can stop a grown man from going from point A to point B, and he's there in a hurry. It, it doesn't happen without you grabbing onto him. And you're right. It, it is a complete mastery of being able to disguise what you're actually doing to impede this guy's progress to the quarterback. So when you talk about hand placement, getting your hands inside the framework of the body, you are extensively holding the shoulder pads just inside the armpits there. So what Tiny is learning is how to disguise what he's doing. And to be honest, he's completely correct. And I know it's frustrating for a lot of guys that can get away with it, you know, when you're being held like that. But you know what? You've got to tip your hat to the best that can disguise exactly what they're doing. And guys like um, like Walter Jones, he had great hand placement. Guys like Larry Allen, great hand placement. Um, you know, a lot of great guards. Mike Munchak was a technician. He was a master of great hand placement. You know, that's well, that's what Tiny's talking about because all of it is holding, every single bit of it. Well, he had an unbelievable game against Clowney in South Carolina last year, and a lot a lot of people talked about that one last play. He took it hard, mm-hmm. even though John Gruden, you probably saw it when Tyler Bray did the uh, the the quarterback camp. John Gruden basically listed reasons why that was on Tyler Bray, not on Tiny Richardson. How, how much of a motivation is that play for Tiny Richardson? Well, it's fuel, definitely. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things where it, it really does. It, it, excuse my candor. It sucks. Mm-hmm. You know, when your job is protection, you can beat the hell out of a guy for sixty-two plays, and then on that sixty-third play, you know, he makes a, a, an unbelievable play. But that changes the course of the game, and you lose. And then all of a sudden it looks like he's a rock star. But that's the that's the world of an offensive lineman. Mm-hmm. So when he hears a guy like John Gruden break down exactly what can happen, and, you know, that's probably up, up for debate um, as to the real reasons why a play breaks down, there's so many situations like that happen all the time, guys, where you're looking at something and you think that this person is responsible for a certain action on the field when he had nothing to do with it. You know what I'm saying? There's, right. You know, there's guys that that might pass up guys in protection because that's not the guy that they're blocking, but he's standing right next to him, and it looks like he's supposed to have him. Right. Well, that's not my guy. But, see, they don't know that by rule. Those are little things about the game that when you when you see John Gruden explain it and break it down, he's a great, um, I guess you could say, uh, liaison between what we're doing actually on the field and getting it into your living room, the information that's necessary. Brad Hopkins joining us here on the new Sentinel Sports page. You guys now have a little more reason to talk to a, a, a Tennessee Titans player by the name of Jonathan Willard. Uh, unbelievable, oh, yeah. unbelievable story, uh, uh, Brad. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on this, and how, how big is a crowd of media going to be around this young man from Clemson? You know, the bad thing is 
I started looking at him on the depth chart, okay, because mm-hmm. I want this to be a story. Right. You know what I mean? First, obviously, this is going to be a camp story going in. This guy's traveling from South Carolina, heading on 40 West, into Titans camp. You know, and this car is ablaze. The lady doesn't even know it. She just, she thinks it's somebody else's vehicle that's actually on fire, not her own. You know, the kid pulls up alongside of her, flashes her down, does her pull over, your car's on fire, helps her extract her family from the car, and it's engulfed in flames. It's an unbelievable story. But it'd be an even better story if he would have, you know, be able to make this team. Mm-hmm. And you look at the Titans' depth, where he actually sits, he's like fourth. I mean, behind Zach Brown and a host of other guys. I just, you know, I really want that to be the story. But yeah, it's an unbelievable story of just, you know, compassion. Here's a guy that's going to, to the NFL, you know what I mean, in his first year as a, as a undrafted free agent and hearing, gets himself involved in a situation that makes him national news. I mean, you couldn't. I'm telling you, his day didn't wasn't planned like that. You know, <laughs> I'm sure that he was hoping he'd be on the news, maybe for making a great play or something during camp, not necessarily saving the life of some people on the way to camp. Well, Brad, you mentioned the the competition there at linebacker. What are with the Titans opening up camp, one of 12 teams around the league doing so today? What are some of the position battles that you're going to be keeping an eye on? Where where are the open spots for starting positions with the Tennessee Titans this year? You know, I'm going to say right now, the starting positions, there, there are no competitions. But what I do see them bringing in is depth. Um, I don't think that the Titans want injuries to be an issue this year. And in doing that, if somebody goes down, you got to be able to rotate like Sharks teeth. So if Colin McCarthy, who, you know, we've had a lot of questions about as far as being able to, you know, last an entire season, if he goes down again, guess what? You've got to have guys in the, behind him that can fill in those spots and fill in and perform admirably. Okay, just like okay, if Chris Johnson doesn't get it done by running the ball, and all of a sudden people start grumbling about the rushing attack, what do you think is going to happen? You think Sean Green's touches are going to go up? You damn stupid they are, and it's the same situation at linebacker. You know, guy's not getting it done, uh, he's getting exposed, or somebody's got a little nick or a ding or something like that. They got ten linebackers right now that you know not all going to make the team, but at least creating a depth situation to keep the productivity high. What do you think of Chance Warmack, another offensive lineman, first round draft pick out of Alabama for the Tennessee Titans? I hope that, or I hope in the near future, guys, that him and Tiny Richards should become uh, best friends. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because Chance has that work ethic. He has that desire, that hunger to be the best at his position that you would hope every offensive lineman would have. Chance Warmack, in my opinion, he doesn't know anything but football. And, and I know that's that's kind of pigeonholing for a guy. He's shaped like a guard. He looks like a guard. He speaks like a guard. Every single thing about this guy says offensive lineman. He's a phenomenal player. I can't wait to see his NFL career start. What do you think of Justin Hunter to this point, the former Tennessee Vol wide receiver? Now that's going to be an intriguing uh, X factor, isn't it? Yeah. I think people are really focusing on Kendall Wright. What's he? You know, what kind of a player is he going to develop into in his second year? And and is Nate uh, Nate Washington going to prove some more things? Is is uh is a guy like uh is a guy like uh, is a guy like um uh Kenny Kenny Brick gonna be healthy and, and, and be able to do that. But you know what? Justin Hunter is a guy that really in my opinion is gonna be a, a sneaky, sneaky little person that, that really is gonna be a playmaker. I really see him getting into some plays, not necessarily in a starting role early, but in a situation where he gets onto the field does like a Cordell Stewart. Remember Cordell Stewart back in the day, Slash would come in there and make some huge plays and really you know, charge up that offense. I see that being a Justin Hunter role this year. Maybe Mike Mike Munchak being putting him into some creative situations. Uh, we start to see a little star emerge because you know that those, the Vol faithful are going to be in that stadium, man. So I think that he's going to be a complete X factor this year. Brad, last couple things with you. We appreciate your time visiting with former NFL star offensive lineman Brad Hopkins here on the new Sentinel Sports page. Brad, the over under for the Tennessee Titans, according to Vegas, for wins this year is six and a half. You go over? Oh, I saw that same thing on Bodog. Oh, man. I, I don't agree. And the reason why I don't agree is because I think that the Titans have that leadership that they haven't had. And I think that the Titans have, have really uh, reestablished that the identity that defensively is necessary to, to really strike fear in the hearts of offense. they got players that, that now can implement that plan. I think Bernard Pollard's voice. And I think with direction from from uh, Greg Williams and, and Jerry Gray, this is going to be a completely different team. And in thinking that way, man, I, I see double-digit wins. I see possibly challenging 
for an AFC South uh, championship. I see them somehow sneaking their way into the playoffs this year. I really do. Okay, well, if that's going to happen, then Jake Locker is going to have a very good year. Your boy Darren McFarlane isn't quite so much on the on the Jake Locker bandwagon right now. You think Jake Locker is going to have a good year now that they've addressed so much around him? Um, have you seen anything that remotely resembles consistency ever since Jake Locker has taken this team? Is there anything been a resemblance of consistency? Around consistency I, around him? Yeah, no. I'm, I'm, talk, no. I'm talking about the whole thing. Right. You can't say his play has been consistent. Obviously because of injuries and because of injuries around him. He hasn't seen anything that resembles any sort of normal, you know, conventional offensive productivity. Mm-hmm. If 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 you put a lot of emphasis on Chris Johnson going into the season and you've got injuries at receiver and, and blocking schemes up front because of injuries at offensive line aren't allowing you to be productive there, defenses know exactly what you're doing. There hasn't been enough of a body of work to, to say whether Jake Locker or not, if you get it done or not in this league. I do know that he's a heck of a player. I do know that he wants to win. I know that he's a heck of a leader as well. I think he has the same intangibles as uh, that Wilson kid up there in Seattle. Um, he just hasn't been, you know, hasn't been surrounded with the, with the same kind of talent that Ralph has, uh, you know, over the past season. So I really see him emerging with a healthy receiving core and a strong rushing attack, you know, creating some flexibility, some some – at least some some options. This guy's going to show you exactly what he's worth, and he's not the thirty first ranked quarterback in this NFL, not by even a long shot. Ron Jaworski uh, certainly uh, took some heat for that, I'm sure, from Titans fans. Brad, last thing on Tiny Richardson, we see him in some first round mock drafts for next year. Is Tiny Richardson that kind of NFL prospect? Oh my gosh. You know, the reason why I'm being so cautious when I say this is because Tiny's not going to like what, I, what I'm going to say. Okay. I, I, you know what? I think I think it's all about the season. You know what I mean? I think it's all about the experience. It's all about you know maturing and, and really being able to slow things down in your mind. You know, I think that he's just now starting to realize who he is as a player. And I'd like to see him have just a couple of more years of dominance in the SEC to really establish himself in the league. Therefore, he doesn't have to carry a heavy stick. I mean, he doesn't have to, you know, to speak, you know, all this craziness. He can just be like, you know, the walking tall, you know, speak falsely but carry a big stick. His, his actions will have already spoken for him. So I would love to have seen him go against Jadeveon Clowney types mm-hmm. uh, in college for a couple more seasons before he goes up against guys that get paid to kill quarterbacks. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you... Right now, Brad, what you just said, every Vol fan just heard that you're going to advise him to return for his <laughs> senior year. So just a heads up on that. Yeah. Well, I just, I, that's, you know, the funny thing about it, I looked at my wife last night and I told her about this meeting that, uh, I mean, this interview that we were going to do today. Mm-hmm. I know that's going to be a topic of discussion. I, I, I you know, first off, I'm, I'm a guy that, that, that really thinks about the next, the next step. Mm-hmm. And football is such a minute part of this young man. Uh, just, there's a lot of depth to him. He's a huge onion. And I know i got to be brief. I, 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 I just want him to be thinking about the things after football and really maximizing the opportunity he has. You know, at UT there, it's, it's more so than just putting yourself on a platform, you know, to be a first pick. You know, it's, it's coming away with some, with some hardware that will ensure you success in anything you do after football. So uh, that's just kind of the way I look at it. But I understand the situation of wanting to get what your dream is, and if he has the chance to reach out and touch it, I can't say he's wrong.